I really love your work because you are trying to get us all to go to the source of what's triggering mental health issues, which is stored experiences yeah. and the alarm in your body and your inability to tolerate or understand what's happening when it goes off. And so I have recently had this experience where I'm waking up and I get these waves of anxiety. And what's interesting is that this is not new for me. I mean, I've struggled with anxiety for 30 years, but we have just recently had a number of huge changes in our life. And I now live in a different state in a very small town. And when I wake up in the morning in the middle of all this change, my alarm is not on the nightstand next to me. It begins in my ankles and it's like a hot lava wave that goes from my ankles, up my legs, all the way up my stomach, and then it solidifies in my chest. And as soon as I feel this wave, my immediate thought is not, oh, I want to feel the alarm. It's, fuck, why am I feeling this? I don't want to feel dread. And then I, do, and then I feel like I just want to hide from it or like try to fall asleep. And I know that it's just my body reacting to all this change. Like it's some sort of stored experience that is coming up. And I've been working so hard on not freaking out when I feel it, right. but turning toward it. And as a medical doctor and a, neuro and a neuroscientist and somebody who, who has struggled with anxiety for 30 years, why is turning toward this alarm the answer in that moment? Like what would happen? Like tell me what happens when you turn toward it and you put your hands on your chest or you go, oh, thank you. You're just trying to protect me because you're scared to death that you now live in Vermont and you have no friends and uh, you're very far away for your kids and you're going to live alone here on this mountain and be even more lonely. Like I get through this whole like catastrophizing, exactly. which only make it worse, yeah, versus... Yeah. Ah, <sighs> welcome this bullshit in. Like, I don't want to. Like, I just don't want it to be there, Russ. Yeah, I get it. I get it. What if it's not bullshit, though, Mel? What if it's what if it's little Mel? Did you have a nickname when you were when you were a little girl? This really is becoming therapy, isn't it? Oh, well, I give it a try. <laughs> yeah, when you started talking about the mismatch with the mom, I'm like, I hope my mother uh -oh. doesn't listen to this episode because I even feel guilty for admitting that we are kind of a mismatch or okay. are a mismatch. Um. Yeah, well, my, my sometimes my mom calls me Melly, and friends of mine call me Melly, and um, yeah, friends of mine called me Melly. Is there a name that you relate to as a child? A nickname that you relate to? You know, in many ways, I think Mel, because okay. I still feel very much like a child at times, and I still mm -hmm. feel like that vulnerable kid, and I still feel like the um person that's on the outside looking at. I feel separate. Like that word separate makes a lot of sense for me. Um, like there's a, a feeling that I have in life that I'm observing what's happening, but I'm not a part of it. Yeah. And, you know, just because you've kind of given me permission here, I mean, you've spent a lot of your life outrunning your anxiety, right? And it's worked for you, Mel. You're very successful. You know, you, it's worked for you. I see this with a lot of very intelligent people they can intellectually kind of outrun their anxiety. What does that even mean? It means that you keep yourself so busy that you don't get a chance to sit with that alarm in your body. I don't so, want to sit with it. That's why. Exactly, exactly. Why do you think moving to Vermont where there's nothing to do is so fucking terrifying? Like there, I can't run to Target to, to make my anxiety go away. Right. Like I feel like I'm addicted to negative stress. And this addiction to negative stress is what I've done to numb my anxiety. Well, it's sublimating it. You, you, what is sub? You, that is a big word. What is sublimating? Yeah, okay, mean? sure, sure, sorry. Um, you've taken this energy and you found a way to make it work for you. So I've taken the negative alarm yep. or the alarm yep. in my body yep. and I've channeled it in a direction so I don't have to feel it. Yes. And when you said, what if the alarm is trying to help you? Yeah. What the hell did you mean by that? What if it's, what if it's little Mel? 
You know, what if it's what if it's the younger version of you saying, "Hey, I need some attention." And then when you say, you know, "Fuck off. I don't want to feel you." <laughs> literally, what if you had a child come up to you in a grocery store and they were crying and they had their hands up in the air to pick them up? Would you push them away? Would you go, "See ya. Fuck off." You know, no you wouldn't. You'd pick that damn child up. But we won't do it for ourselves. God, that's, that's so problem. true. Yeah, we won't do it for ourselves. We'll do it for our Wait, pets. Yeah, you're right. Ahead. You're absolutely right. Like if I, if somebody, if you, if somebody else had an alarm going off in their body, yep, and they were like freaking out or worried or sad or upset or needing attention or reassurance, you would give that to them. But we without it, without, it, without hesitation. I'm sure with Sawyer and Oakley, you do that all the time. All the time. Yeah, but you don't do it for yourself. No, and I think that this is the singular biggest like mistake that society has made around understanding anxiety. I, th I just had a huge breakthrough here. Holy Good. shit, Russ. Um, okay, so let Keep me just see if I can give this back to everybody listening. Sure. So it's the fact that you're scared of the alarm or you can't tolerate it and you don't understand what it's trying to ask of you that makes it worse yes and if you were to realize that any tension or fear or kind of scary feeling in your body is an alarm system that from is your child. At, from your inner child or asking you for yeah. reassurance or love or attention and you just gave yourself that reassurance or love or attention the alarm would turn off is that what you're saying slowly yeah because it's been an adaptation for you too you got to remember that the ego thinks it's protecting you by fire I, I don't understand what the ego is that, that's oh, too intellectual for me so have so to have so you back. That's I will have you back to talk about the ego, but the second anybody says ego, I'm like, oh, this is somebody who's way smarter than me. I don't want to try to figure out what the hell an ego is. Like, so, 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 and we will have you back because we all need to know what the ego is. However, sure. I just want to stay on this because I think this is a groundbreaking idea that I want everybody who either has some level of situational or generalized anxiety or loves somebody who has situational or generalized anxiety. And at that, at this moment in time, that would be every human being on the planet. And I want you to understand that we have been taught that we're supposed to attack it from the neck up mm -hmm. with the thinking first. And that's one of the things you need to do to cope. But the real heart of healing your anxiety, which you claim you've done, and I wanna hear about that, yeah. But that the and I don't and I don't mean to use the word claim like I don't believe you. I I'm, claim that I have gotten so much better, but yeah. <laughs> well, well, you're a medical doctor, so you can say that. I feel like I understand anxiety. I still hate it, and I need to have a different relationship with it. You do, and I need to, and everybody needs, yeah. for the sake of your kids, the people that you love, for yourself. You need to understand this alarm system in your body and the fact that it desperately needs you. And you need to take a neck down approach to listening to the alarm and diffusing it in a way that, wow. So over time, if you do this, the alarm doesn't go off as much? Uh, no, yeah, that's true. Uh, it's not as intense and you're not compulsively running up into your head when you feel the alarm. So if I had a motorcycle in my front yard, I used to work emerge as a doc and it's like, I don't, you know, you I used don't, to, does emerge mean emergency? Oh, emergency. Yeah. The, okay. So you used to work in the emergency room as a yeah. doctor. I delivered babies. I did kind of the whole kind of general thing. Okay. Now, uh, if I had a motorcycle in my front yard, that's why I bring up motorcycles is because I used to see bad accidents with motorcycles. I don't condone motorcycles. I think they're fun, but they're dangerous. Anyway, sidetrack. So if I had a motorcycle in my front, I've never ridden one before. So if I had a motorcycle in my front driveway and I had 50 books on how to, how to you know, drive a motorcycle, ride a motorcycle, 
And then I go out to the I go out to the motorcycle, I sit on it, and I go, no, you know what? I gotta go back and I gotta read a little more about how the brakes work. And then I'm gonna until you get on that frickin' motorcycle and ride it around and maybe fall off a few times, which is the same thing with the emotion. As soon as you get on the alarm, you start actually feeling better. Like when you said about that thing about the person in the the school drop off. Mm -hmm. As soon as you put your hand over that place of alarm, you will feel instantly better. I'm not saying it's going to, you know, take it from a, a nine to a two, but it's going to take it from a nine to a four because you're actually from a, a consciousness perspective, you are actually going at the root source of the problem, which is this little child in you that says, I don't like this person. And it's not this person. It's basically, I don't like someone from my past that this person reminds me of. That's or I don't like the feeling that I have in my body when I see this person, and yeah. this is a familiar feeling from my past. Yeah. yeah. So for That's example, if you had like a chaotic parent or an unpredictable parent or a mentally ill parent or an absent parent, that is, this goes back to your original point. Yeah. When you have a parent that you can't either connect with or that is unpredictable or that makes you feel invisible or not safe, that alarm system in your body develops as a child. And that is what you're saying when you say all anxiety has resulted because of separation anxiety as a child. When you feel separate or unsafe or unseen or not heard or not loved or invisible in your home, that original experience that you probably don't remember yeah that encoded your body when you were tiny yeah and anytime then from that point forward anytime you again felt invisible or you felt attacked or you felt unloved that alarm got even stronger and so now it's like this automatic response in your body to those situations where you feel separate. Am I getting this? Yeah, totally. Yeah, and what happens is when we feel the alarm, we go up into our heads to escape it because we feel this alarm in our body. It's like, I don't want to feel this. So we go up into our heads and we try and think, well, you know, what could this be? You know, we analyze, we go into this, we, we have this like just fixation, this left hemisphere of fixation on figuring stuff out, which basically just creates more of a problem. You know, I talk about in my, in my book about, you know, Ulysses and the si Siren Island, you know, so Ulysses. Again, is... you're way smarter than me. So you got to tell me the story. Okay. So it's basically is this like this a Greek book? myth class that I, yeah, I skipped I... in college. Okay. Yeah. It's that English stuff. I, you know, I'd much rather write a physics exam than an English exam. But anyway, so it's basically Siren Island. So there's these beautiful women on this island. And what the sailors will do when they hear these beautiful women singing is they'll run their ships aground. And then they'll try and swim to these sirens. And the sirens turn into monsters and kill them, hack them apart, whatever they want to do. So, so it basically, that's your thoughts. Your thoughts are like Siren Island. Your thoughts are trying to suck you into going, hey, we have the answer. We have the answer. When all they have is more problem. You're not going to solve anxiety, which is basically a problem of overthinking with more freaking thinking. It's just not going to work. Well, so, okay. So, so can I ask you a question? Why the hell, if there is an alarm system wired in our body, yep. why is our brain not able to go, it's just an alarm system. Just give yourself a hug and take a deep breath. Thank it for trying to protect you. Next. Why do we not just automatically say that? Why do we kill ourselves in our own minds with our thoughts? Because we don't understand it's there in the first place. We don't understand. The alarm? Yeah. We don't understand that it's our younger self asking for our attention. So we feel pain. And like any organism, we withdraw from pain. And when we, it's like that, the motorcycle that is on the front, if I don't get on that motorcycle and ride it around, maybe fall off a couple of times, I'm never really going to learn how to acclimatize to that emotion, that alarm. Bessel van der Kolk talks about that in The Body Keeps the Score. We're not teaching people how to get rid of their anxiety. We're teaching them how to acclimatize to it. And then I add on to that and stop adding thoughts to it. Because as soon as you add thoughts to the alarm, a, you're getting out of the problem, and B, you're just making it worse. So you know, it's, yeah. Go ahead, please. So basically, we get in this thing what I call the alarm anxiety cycle. So something triggers us. Say we're say we're in that lineup. We see this person that we don't like. 
and then we go, oh, why don't I like this person? I should really, I should really try and make an effort. You know, I should really, you know, it's like, well, no, no, she did this or he did I'm that. I'm like, don't make eye contact. Get yeah. on the phone. Make a fake yeah. phone call. Whatever. Avoid, avoid. Turn shoulder, turn yeah. shoulder. Holy Look shit, away. are they closer? Like, I'm like, what? Run away. Yes. Run away. You know, to quote a Monty Python thing. So, so basically what we're doing is we're trying to intellectualize the alarm that we're feeling in our body. And it, the, the, the. It's not the, the solution isn't in our minds. The solution's in our body, which is why so many people have a hard time healing from anxiety because we're trying to use more thoughts to combat overthinking. My big takeaway right now so far is that all the thinking that we reflexively do about the feelings in our body right. makes the alarm louder. Well, and we that we have to learn to stop going above the neck and thinking about what's going on and we need to train ourselves to go below the neck into our bodies and turn toward the alarm and give ourselves the reassurance and the soothing or whatever it is that the alarm is asking for in that moment yeah and then if you do that you are now taking step one on the path of truly what do you, what would you call Getting it? it Dealing, cause. calming, uh, curing Getting your anxiety. Getting at the root cause. Getting, Getting the, at the root cause. That's exactly what it is. You're getting at the root cause, which is the alarm. The thoughts are not the cause. The thoughts are a symptom. So the thoughts are just a byproduct of this alarm that's stuck in your body. Now, thoughts do cause, you know, anxiety. There's no two ways about that. But I think we where we where the mismanage is where the where the mistake is is that we believe the thoughts originate before the feeling and well, i'm know, saying the feeling starts before the thought the feeling starts before the thought because the, every one of us knows a kid that can work themselves up into a panic attack because they think they're going to throw up sure and what i now realize after years of having kids with anxiety and reading so many books about this subject that I should have a PhD and being in years of therapy myself is that if a child, like let's take my son. So our son Oakley, when he was little, he was constantly picked on at school. So of course he felt nervous in the morning before he had to head into school. Sure. Plus the kid had dyslexia and ADHD, all of which was not diagnosed. So he's heading into a full day in a classroom where he physiologically, neurologically is incapable of doing what is going to be asked of him. And so his body before entering that situation sounds an alarm. Totally. And when the alarm sounds and the physiological changes happen, guess what physiological feeling he has? His stomach starts to rumble because as the physiology of the alarm changes and the chemistry in his digestive tract changes, he starts getting butterflies that feel like pterodactyls. And then all of a sudden, instead of just giving himself a hug and going, it's going to be okay. Today's going to be an okay day. I can face this. Instead of reassuring himself, he goes into his head and says, oh my God, my stomach, I think I'm going to puke. I can't go to school. Holy, holy da, 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 da. And he ramps himself. We were dealing with panic attacks with this kid where he would literally bang his head on the kitchen island. I don't want to go to school crying. He would force himself to throw. He would get so worked up, he would actually throw up. I mean, it was horrible. And I now can see that all of the interventions that were being done with this kid, with therapists, which were all about just change the channel upstairs. Right. And yeah. then he would turn to them and say, but sometimes when I change the channel, it takes me to a channel I don't want to watch. So what if I change the channel of my thoughts and I get another bad thought? Like even he was reacting against it, but nobody taught us that what the kid needed was a hug, validation, reassurance in that moment physically to get the alarm to quiet. Hey, it's Mel. I want you to stop thinking about what you want and actually do something about it. What can you do? Jump into my new free training called Make It Happen. This training gives you the tools. It's packed with science. It comes with a free workbook. It's exactly what you need right now. 
More than half a million people are taking it. You have the power to change your life. Together, let's make it happen. All you got to do is click on the link in the caption, melrobbins.com slash make it happen. It's free. I created it for you. Why wouldn't you take it? Don't miss out on the life you could be living. Let's make it happen together. This is from oh, this is a, an 11th grader. This is an interesting... Well, Anxiety like... is consuming me and I'm so scared. 11th grade. Mm, okay. Well, I think my first thing is that you're not alone. I think a lot of people feel it. I also have anxiety. Um, and it's very scary. It is very scary. And it, it can feel very consuming. Um, my anxiety, I'll, I'll give you a little peek into my window is what I get like. But when I was younger, I used to be very scared of throwing up. And so my anxiety morphed into this thing now even nowadays that whenever I'm anxious, I just feel as though I'm going to throw up. I never do, but I always feel like I'm going to throw up. And it was very overbearing. It was very uh, scary. And I felt very alone for a lot of it. And I felt very misunderstood. And my advice to you is that if it is feeling like you cannot live your life anymore, you should seek therapist or you should tell somebody maybe not a therapist tell a parent tell a friend just tell anybody that is huge that's the first step because then you're not letting it run there run your life you're showing that you're in control you can tell people what's going on can i ask a question yeah so when you say you can't live your life do you mean and the anxiety is getting to a point where you're like opting out of doing things yes you're yes. managing your anxiety Mm -hmm. Because your anxiety, you're so worried about your anxiety that you're like not living your life. Like your friends are all hanging out and they're going out to dinner and you're too anxious. So you're just like, I don't want to be anxious. Like, I don't want to go. That's, and that was you. That was me. So that's when you should start telling somebody. Um, I have two things I want to add on to that. I said something about therapy. Uh, therapy's great. I love therapy. I have a great therapist. And second is medication is also great. I, when I took medication as a kid, I was like, I'm different from everybody. Like I have to take medication because I have a problem. There's something wrong with me, but there's nothing wrong with you. If you take medication, I mean, every, like literally everybody takes medication. <laughs> like, I take it. I take it all to Advil's like medication. Like there's nothing wrong with you if you're taking medication for anxiety. And honestly, if you're taking medication, like you're going to be able to live your life better. You're going to be able to go out to that dinner with your friends. You're going to be able to go on that walk or that run. You're going to have a good time. So. And so get, do what you need to do to get the anxiety under control. Yeah. And I recommend if you don't know where to start, just tell somebody. Tell somebody. And tell them everything. Like, don't leave some stuff out. Don't be like, hey, I'm kind of anxious every now and then. Like, be like, I am anxious and it is terrifying every day. Great. And here's the other thing. The tools and strategies that are out there actually work. Yeah, they do work. And anxiety is a, t is a scary thing, but it's temporary. If you follow the tools and strategies that work. It is 100% temporary. Yeah. Yeah. And you will feel better. The best feeling, I can assure you, is when you look back and you're like, I was at a bottomless pit and now... I'm outside and I'm looking back at it and I'm like, wow, like I felt that way. That's crazy. Yeah. You don't even, you can't even believe that you felt that bad. Mm -mm. That was me a year. Do you remember Mother's Day a year ago? I remember a lot of things a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a lot. I remember a lot. When I was sobbing about the fact that we had sold our house and I was begging dad to try to get it back because I didn't yeah. want to move here. Yeah. I remember and, that. And you three kids were here. I and remember I, I like told my friends, I was like, guys, we're going to move back to like Massachusetts. <laughs> like my mom's like pretty sure this time <laughs> like, you should see her. <laughs> she is freaking. I was in a full blown anxiety attack. What was it like for you as a kid to see me lose it? Like really have a mental health breakdown? I think. It was helpful and scary. How like, is it helpful? Because it's nice to know that your parents, uh, well, it's nice to know that your parents can break down and that like if you as a kid see your parent as this strong, like tall, super emotionally put together person, 
that's how you're going to see them forever. And when you grow up and you see your parent break down for the first time, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, like what? And so when I was a kid and I was young and I saw you break down and I saw you break down again in the future, I was like, oh, like this is just what happens. Like people break down. Like it's totally fine. Maybe not totally fine, but like it's fine. I was used to it. Yeah. You can't be happy all the time. Nobody's happy all the time. No. And life is going to be ups and downs. And I think you're right. It is helpful to watch the adults in your life process things and mm. realize that there are periods in your life where you're going to feel like you're in a bottomless pit. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the clouds pass and things are sunny again. Yeah. And that's just part of life. Yeah. And you don't need to share like the nitty gritty with your kids. You don't need to tell them everything that's like making you upset or why, but you know, let them in. Like they are part of your family. They're there to support you. It's good to tell them how you're feeling and how you can be supported. Yeah. Um, my 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels Twins. different. <laughs> Twins. My 14 year old son is dyslexic and feels different and dumb mm. and shuts down instead of trying harder. Mm. Help. I like this question because when I was diagnosed with dyslexia as a kid, I was, I felt the same way. I was like, I'm so dumb. Like, I can't read. I can't believe this. Like, I'm dumber than everybody. And I, like, remember you'd be like, well, the people on Shark Tank are dyslexic. And I was like, <laughs> shut the fuck up. Like, I don't care about the people on Shark Tank. <laughs> they don't matter. All right. They could be dyslexic, but they're also multimillionaires. Like, I'm, I'm 11. All right. What do I have? All right. I have $2 to my name. Um, <laughs> but but what I'm going to say is that uh, there's a lot of techniques and skills you can learn to make dyslexia more manageable. Um, it's also different for everybody. Uh, it's different in that sense. Um, but you are not dumb if you are dyslexic. Um, you What's actually happening is that and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but like the scientific thing is that your neural, your, uh, your neural pathways like take longer to form. And so you can have the same uh, strong neural pathways as other people it just takes a little bit longer to get there. Is that? Yeah. Does that right? Basically yeah. your brain wiring is a little bit different and there are techniques and strategies that you can use to really like you basically had your dyslexia remediated yeah by you can you can have it like put it like push down yeah because you're you you just basically train your brain to wire and fire new neural pathway connections and it's called orton gillingham that is the gold standard uh tutoring method and so it's not about uh, trying harder and that's what is really important your brain learns differently and because you're dyslexic, you have profoundly different talents. Yeah. You know, you're being asked to sit in a classroom and do things that your brain is not firing to do, but I bet that you are way more creative than everybody else. Yep. I bet that you can solve problems in creative ways. I For bet sure. you are probably more talkative. Yeah, definitely. I bet you have much better profound spatial awareness, meaning you're phenomenal at video games mm -hmm. and at Legos and mm -hmm. about building things. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be an incre and you're an incredible problem solver. And so understanding that you've got these unbelievable talents that developed because other parts of your brain developed. Yeah. That is a superpower. For sure. And that's why so many entrepreneurs and actors and professors and people in the arts have dyslexia because by not having the neural pathways fully formed as it relates to reading and holding words in your mind and yeah. decoding words and, and also holding pencils and, and being yeah. able to write, you developed other parts of your brain. And mm -hmm. that's a really cool thing. And so first of all, I would say, stop saying try harder. Yeah. And if you have not gotten the proper tutoring protocols put in place that really help and other things really help like being able to listen to books instead of reading yeah yeah yeah. i listen to books all the time yeah because like i i'm not the best reader so like i'm a little slow but listening to books is huge like that's great yeah and also being able to type instead of handwrite mm -hmm. there you can get the teacher's notes there are all kinds of things that help and you know i remember it was really interesting because you're an excellent math student yeah. but when professors or teachers require you to show your work 
you basically fail because you can't explain the steps that you took to get there. Yeah. Your brain has I, all these I just, shortcuts. I like, can do it in my head and like I can yes. write, I write down a few numbers just to remember things, but other than that, like I can't really. So if you have dyslexia, you're not dumb. All right. What you are you? Are, you are you're incredibly powerful in other aspects that aren't the school environment. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine because school is not your whole life. That's right. I love that. Where do we all begin? Yeah. It, you know, the thing is first understand that food creates mood. Food creates mood. So we're always trying to find out ways to make ourselves happier. Right. Think more clearly be more satisfied, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I got so interested in this work because with my background in nutrition and being a doctor, I thought, well, if we can control our mood through food and the actions that we take on a daily basis, why aren't we talking about this? Why isn't this first-line therapy? Um, there's really good research, uh, a new study from South Australia that the combination of diet and exercise yep. was 1.5 times more effective for depression than the leading medications. Now explain why, because that's a big research result that just through food and exercise, yeah. it was found to be one and a half times more effective than medication alone. And if you think about it, they actually even put therapy and medications kind of the traditional treatment into yeah. one category okay and they compared that with changing your diet with changing your sleep your exercise lifestyle habits okay and they said we should be prescribing this as first-line therapy for depression there's an anxiety the multiple anxiety studies adhd i mean we are missing the boat obviously we're not doing something right because depression is skyrocketing so is anxiety so is obesity so is diabetes so is cardiovascular disease so the status quo is not working so why not employ these techniques and put them at the forefront so things like we talked about in already and that are in the book are teaching you that we have control that yes do all the things but also change the way you eat, change the way you exercise, get more sunlight. Well, you might be depressed and anxious and struggling with a lot of stuff because of what you're reading yes, and because of your lifestyle right now. And so I think it's really great news to hear that you can feel better if you start to eat better. And that this whole cycle that you are trapped in, in terms of the cravings that never end and the cycle of emotional eating and feeling lethargic and feeling anxious, that you can, based on the research and based on the work that you do with patients around the world, that when you take your food intake seriously, you can profoundly change your mood, you can change your body, you can change your lifestyle, all of it. But it begins with the food. I worry a lot about anxiety and I worry about how we seem to have a parenting crisis of parents who can't tolerate their kids' anxiety and are allowing their kids' anxiety to run the house. Can you give us some advice, especially given that teenagers are so such emotional beings to begin with? How do you give space for the normal emotion without letting a teenager's emotion run your house or dictate what they do? Well, thank you for bringing up this. I mean, it's a huge topic. Um, and actually, between Untangled and the Emotional Lives of the Teenagers, I published a book called Under Pressure, Confronting the Epidemic of Stress and Anxiety in Girls. But what I hear all the time is 80% applies to kids of all genders, which I am sure is true. And in that book, I actually make, at the outset, a case for healthy anxiety and a case for healthy stress. And we have always, as psychologists, recognized that their healthy anxiety is the anxiety that alerts us when something's wrong. It is not on its own pathological. And it, it, we have not helped the situation by using the same word to describe mm. healthy anxiety and something that we diagnose. Um, it's sort of better set. We have the word sadness and we have depression for the diagnosis, but we use anxiety 
you know, in both categories. So that doesn't help us as much. And same with stress. Stress is actually the human experience of adaptation. We experience stress mm. anytime things change, anytime we have to adapt to a new condition. And it can be a wonderful condition or a lousy condition, but we always experience stress under change conditions. And we only consider stress pathological if it is chronic or traumatic. But all other stress, we just talk into the, you know, helping you grow doesn't always feel good category. Um, what I will tell you is that the most important thing for people to know about anxiety is that avoidance feeds anxiety. And this is one of the, again, most critical findings in psychology and one that we have done a completely terrible job of getting out to the public. And here's how it works. If I, let's say, have some social avoidance, some social anxiety, and there's a party that I've been invited to, and it's a good party to go to, right? It's a rational, it like, should be fun, a friend of mine's party. But say I feel anxious, and say I agree to go to the party, but then the day of my anxiety is starting to really accelerate. And then I'm thinking, I don't think I should go, I don't wanna go. And say my parent is like, ah, oh, it's just a party, you don't have to go, right? Here's what happens. The first thing that happens is I feel so much better, right? My anxiety was cresting, and then I get to avoid, and it immediately plummets, it's like, what we call reinforcement, right? Instantly relief. And so the upshot of that is the next time next time I feel anxious, I know what helps me feel better, it's avoidance. So that's the first problem. The second problem is that I never go to the party and check out how how it is, right? So whatever I have daydreamed about how terrifying this party is or how to you know like mm. how cruel everyone will be at the party, that is now sealed in amber. And I continue to believe it because I have no counter evidence. Whereas if I go to the party, I'm like, oh, wait, it's not so bad. But if I don't go, so it actually entrenches anxiety to avoid the things we fear. Now, if a kid is avoiding school, which a lot of kids are right now, there's a third issue, which is the minute you don't show up at school, you are out of the loop socially and you are out of the loop academically. So it's that much harder to get back in. So there's not a lot in psychology where there is agreement across the entire field where there is zero controversy. But on this one, everyone's in agreement that avoidance feeds anxiety and everyone is in agreement that exposure is the answer. And what I mean by that is you have to get in. You have to, you know, you don't have to go to every party all the time, but you have to baby step your way in. You have to go check out the party. You cannot have the reinforcement of avoidance. You cannot have the daydream become the reality. And so if this is your kid and they're like, I can't go to school, I can't go to the party, I can't, you know, fill in the blank, you say, all right, here's the deal. You're going to go to the party for 20 minutes and then I'm going to forget something and text you <laughs> and see if, you know, you need me to pick you up. And if you need me to pick you up after 20 minutes, I'll get you. But if you can stay, that would be better. So you have to negotiate. You have to help them get in. Breathing is powerful for helping to control anxiety. Reframing is powerful for helping to control anxiety. But avoidance is anxiety's best friend. It's devastating because it, you're right. Like I think about the fact that I was homesick at every camp, so much so that I would just escalate it until the counselors got so tired and my parents would show up because it works. It goes back to your original thing. We do these things because they work. They work. And when we allow our kid to keep transferring from one school to another, because they can't handle it, we are locking in anxiety as a coping mechanism and avoidance as a coping mechanism. Are you procrastinating on YouTube again? I can help you fix that for free. I'm Mel Robbins. I'm an expert on confidence and motivation. And right now you need both. I've been there. You know what you need to do, but you're wasting time on YouTube. Stop procrastinating. Start executing by taking my free two-part training series, Make It Happen with Mel Robbins. Two video lectures taught by me, a 25-page workbook to get you in action. You deserve this, so grab your free spot with me. Just click the link, make it happen, or you can go back to procrastinating. YouTube will be waiting, but don't you dare miss out on living the life you could be living. Make it happen. Hey Mel, my name is Lena. My father passed his anxiety to me and the rest of my siblings growing up. I'm trying to not let my children adopt being short-tempered and anxious like many people in my family are. How can I break this generation cycle of anxiety and uneasiness and start healing? That was Lena, who's a listener of the Mel Robbins podcast, and she had a question about 
how you recognize anxiety in your parents, especially when people don't talk about it. We're here with Dr. Russell Kennedy. So Dr. Kennedy, is anxiety genetic? No. The short answer is no. There are there are mental illnesses, and I put that in quotation marks, that do seem to have a bit more of a genetic component to it, like schizophrenia and bipolar. But anxiety in and of itself is not genetic. We haven't really isolated anything that would say this is the anxiety gene or anything. What I do think that we have genetically is a, a tendency to be sensitive. So if you are born sensitive, which everybody I see with anxiety, everybody I've ever cons- consulted with, with anxiety is a sensitive person. You are a sensitive person. How do you know if you're a sensitive person? Because you have anxiety. No, it's well, because you feel everything. And then the other part about feeling everything as a sensitive person is to survive. It's kind of like autism in a way. To survive, you have to start shutting off your connection because it's just too Mm, much. mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens when you're born sensitive is you learn ways of protecting yourself because your home life doesn't give you the love and attention that you need. Now, you could have good parents who are loving and caring, but just because we are more sensitive, we just need more love. I need more love than my brother. Like right. it's just, he is more, he, he's not as sensitive as I am. So, so your parents could have been fine in a way, but if you are sensitive and you need more love, what you will do is if you don't get it, you will start going to the dark side, you know, use your fault, use the false loop, you know? So it's, it's, it's important to understand that you need more love and you have to start really giving that to yourself without this becoming like a, you know, a pity party, like, oh, everybody has to love each other, hold hands, sing Kumbaya. No, it's really something that you learn how to give love, compassion and attention to yourself. Well, it's like and, learning to feed yourself for crying out loud. Yeah, like it's that it basic. Is. So how do you break this cycle of anxiety in a family? Well, so first you start breaking the cycle in yourself. So you start realizing that this anxiety I feel is actually this alarm in my body. I'm going to pay attention to that because that is my younger self. And I have many, many people contact me and say, oh, my 15-year-old daughter is so anxious. Can you see her? Can you see her? And it's like, no, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix you first. It's like Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer. He doesn't fix the dog. He fixed the parent. So that's what I work on with people. As I work on the parent, I show the parent how to heal themselves. And then that energy just seems to translate into the children. Mm-hmm. They start saying, you know, hey, mom, you seem more connected because she is, because she's not in that alarm state where she can actually give love and attention to her kids. So those kids can get filled up and feel safe. And then that gets handed down from generation to generation. So anxiety isn't sort of genetic, but we are born sensitive, a lot of us. If your mother or father was anxious, which mine was, um, both my parents actually were quite anxious, you will start seeing that and, and almost be operantly conditioned to create that anxiety because you feel it in them. So a lot of the kids that I, or people that refer their kids to me are because they are anxious themselves and they feel helpless and powerless to help themselves, let alone help their kids. And then they feel horrible that they've kind of transferred this anxiety gene, quote unquote, to their kids. And it's really about heal yourself first and then your kids will come along. Your kids will start feeling that. So it's not about the kids. It's about the adults a lot of the time. So that's so for, for Lena, it would be, okay, how do we find your alarm? How do we find the best time in your life? How do we start changing that pattern, that automatic pattern of negativity and irritability in you first? And then you're more available to your kids. And when you're more available to your kids, your kids don't feel so alarmed themselves and you start healing that whole generational cycle. Anxiety in a family mm-hmm. is not about the kids. It's about the adults. Yes. And you help kids that have anxiety by addressing and healing the anxiety in the adults in that family. 99% of the time, yeah. So Dr. Kennedy, what are surprising signs of adult anxiety, particularly for that generation of our parents who never talked about this, 
Prozac was not even invented yet. Mm -hmm. That was not a generation of expressing feelings. So how that was the C, uh, you know, be, be seen and not heard generation. It was, you know, shut up and pull up your big girl I'll panties. I'll give you something to cry about. Yeah, I'll give you something to cry about. No, I'm, I'm dead serious because- <laughs> No, I am too, yeah. My mom recently said to me, you know, never even occurred to me that I had anxiety hmm. because maybe I didn't want to feel all that stuff. Exactly. Maybe I'm afraid to to like go talk to a therapist and open that all up. Like we didn't talk about our feelings. And so it didn't occur to me until recently that gosh, you know, my mom clearly had a lot of trauma in her childhood and felt invisible. And I've never looked at her and been like the woman has anxiety. <laughs> so what are the surprising signs? that your parents may be dealing with anxiety. It's just never been talked about in your family. Alcoholism, <laughs> that's a big one. Because you know they didn't, they didn't have the open dialogue that we have now. So it wasn't okay. You know, Mental illness had a tremendous stigma. And it still does, it's, it still really does. So there's, there's this um, resistance to actually admitting you have a problem because that child in you or in them that is loud and painful, it's easier in a way to just keep stuffing that child down because it's not talked about. I don't want to be different than anyone else. So we, we just accept our nervous system as this is what we're stuck with. And this is the way it's going to go. It's been like this for 10 or 15 years. I've been like so many people that say I've been in therapy for like five, 10, 15 years. And yeah, I mean, I feel a little bit better, but I'm not really getting there. When you look at therapy costing $150 an hour, you know, it's pretty frustrating for people. It's pretty out of reach for people. Let me ask you another question because I want to yeah. back you up because I yeah, do think ahead. the surprising symptoms are something we oh. got to talk about. Sure. So, and I'd love to kind of tick off some because sure. I think this is a big wake up call. I mean, our parents didn't talk about their feelings yeah. because it didn't matter if they did. It wasn't yeah. normalized. Nobody was going to do shit about it anyway. And if you were uh, struggling with alcohol, you're a bum. And if you, like my great-grandmother, were bipolar, you were institutionalized and given shock treatments. And you would just, quote, go away for a couple weeks. And you were called mean. And so I want to talk about what are the signs that may surprise you yeah. That your parents have anxiety and you didn't even know it. So alcoholism was one. But what are the other signs? Irritability. People, parents that are chronically irritable. Um, not connected. Just not feeling connected to a parent. You know, my mother is very warm and caring at points and very cold and distant at others. I think that's kind of like the British way in a lot of ways. And so for a child, it's like, hey, you know, sometimes you're rubbing my back and, and we're feeling connected and other times you're cold as ice. So in a way, that's almost worse than being consistently one or the other. If she was consistently cold, I would learn how to protect myself from that. If she was consistently warm, I wouldn't need protection in the first place. So for a lot of us kids had emotional dysregulation in our parents that we didn't recognize. So sometimes they'd be nice and connected and other times they'd be off the deep end. And I think irritability is one way of doing that. Hypervigilance, hyperorganization, you know, these things that, that show up in our parents because they didn't have a way of expressing it. They didn't know, or, or they went to therapy and a lot of people go to therapy and they, they, they've been in there for five years and they feel terrible because it's like, I've been in therapy. I've been in this, you know, CBT thing. And it's, it's really, it helped me at first. And, and, but now I'm, I'm just feeling just as bad as I always have. And I've just spent, you know, $40,000 on 10 years of therapy. And it's because, you know, they're, they're not addressing the root cause. And I think hypervigilance shows up. I think irritability, um, drug abuse. Um, and I'm not talking like, you know, cocaine or whatever, it's, you know, prescription drugs, that kind of stuff that the people need to kind of cope. Because like I said, when we go into survival mode, we become very inaccessible, both to ourselves and to other people. 
And when we're warm and connected to ourselves, we can extend that out to other people. A lot of people are more connected to their pets than they are to their spouse because they see their pet as safe. They don't see their spouse as safe because their spouse reflects some of the, the, the crimes of the parent in a way. So it's really, it's very interesting to see how anxiety shows up, how childhood trauma shows up in people. And it's usually emotional dysregulation of some kind where they can't connect. And another way of connecting that doesn't look like it is the people pleaser, is the mom who's doing making cookies for everybody and doing all this stuff and, and appears so connected because we're very good. Like anxious people are very smart. We know how to present uh, an image that appears connected, but really isn't. But people can feel it. People can feel your authenticity when you're connected. Um, the point that really struck me there was uh, somebody who is just so loving and kind with an animal mm -hmm. and cold with other people. Yeah, because they didn't trust their parents. Their parents didn't, didn't establish that people are safe. My dad didn't establish that he was, even though my dad was really kind and loving and playful and great uh, at many, many times. In fact, most of the time that I spent with him was good. But it's like when you get that one bad experience with a dog, it takes a thousand good experiences to kind of erase it a little bit. So true. So it's really important. Again, our brains, we have a fear bias. We are evolutionarily programmed to focus on fear. And another thing that I got from one of your, your podcasts recently is, you know, and I said this a lot is whatever you focus on, you get more of. So if you focus on your anxiety, you'll get more anxiety. If you focus on gratitude, you'll get more gratitude. You'll see more, you'll see more Broncos around is basically what it comes down to. Hey Mel, I'm a 53 year old woman, a creative leader with, to the outside world at least, uh, a so-called great career, I guess you'd say, but with crippling anxiety and exhausting overthinking. Traveling accompanied by panic attacks, oh, what the heck. Um, I've had this issue for 30 years and all the guided meditations and mindfulness training pods in the world aren't helping. So what steps can I take to stop this, to heal and find a new peace before I chuck in the towel and just barricade myself in at home? Thanks for everything. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins, and that was a listener of the Mel Robbins podcast named Carrie. Today, we are talking anxiety toolkit. How do you heal from it? We're here with the world-renowned Dr. Russell Kennedy, and we've been talking about how all anxiety begins in childhood, which is why if you're ever going to heal it, you're going to have to go back to those moments in your past and in your childhood that were painful when you felt unsafe or separate. And I promised that we would take Carrie's question and now dive into tools. What are specific tools that we can use, Dr. Kennedy, to truly start to heal this? Do you print out a photo of yourself when you were little and you make that your screensaver, which it feels like we should? <laughs> How do you start? Oh, my gosh. Oh. That's me at three. Rusty. Yep. That's Rusty. So for those of you who are listening to this and not watching this podcast on YouTube, Dr. Kennedy just held up the homepage of his phone and there was a photo of him that's three years old. It just made my heart go. Yeah. Oh. He's pretty cute. So He's what does it do cute. if you do that for yourself? Well, that's the start. Right. That, because there's so much resistance to going back to visiting. That's the big thing, because the child in us needs this love and support so much that it creates all this alarm to get our attention. And yet, as adults, we push the alarm away. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I think I might have mentioned this in the last you know podcast that we did is that if, if a child came up to you with their hands up in a grocery store, like they'd lost their parents, of course you would soothe them. But we have this alarm that goes off in our system, which is essentially the younger version of us going, hey, pick me up, pick me up. I need some attention. I need some love. And instead we mm -hmm. go to the internet and zombie scroll Instagram or go into our addictions or whatever. And we push that child away. So the child just gets louder. The alarm just gets louder and louder and louder. 
but there is a resistance to going back. So the adult doesn't want to go back and visit the child because the child holds all their pain. And the child has a real mistrust of us as adults because we've been ignoring their alarm for 30 years. So it's it's really important that we start slowly and you make that connection. So when you say get a picture, that can be really triggering for people. So sometimes I just say in your mind's eye, picture yourself at any age as a child that you want, you know, picture what you're wearing, um, picture yourself maybe at a happy time in your life, you know, like for you, it was like skiing or something like that. Picture yourself in this happy place. And that way you start making that connection Mm -hmm. because, you know, just to go in and, and, you know, it's, (laughs) you're going to blow your brains out if you go back in and you, you, you go right to the child, go right to the trauma. So go to a place that, you felt good. And I use this a lot when I when I work with people is what was the best time in your life? Like what was the what was the best time in your life, Mel? Um, I just immediately had this image of being on the front yard of our house in Michigan. And there were all kinds of kids around, and it was a beautiful summer night. And it was kind of that time of night where it's not quite dark, mm-hmm. but it's not quite daytime it's that beautiful it's my favorite time of night dusk when the when the twinkly stars first start to come out and it's kind of confusing because the sun's up but you see the moon and Mm -hmm. and you know that the sun's about to set and we are playing games like we're playing uh bass and statue and uh all kinds of just tag and and like just that moment right there with my brother and a bunch of other kids in the neighborhood running around being kids in the front yard of our house in Michigan where I grew up. Okay. So close your eyes and really get into that image. Like see your brother, see your house, relax your shoulders, relax your jaw. Nice breath in and out. Just really see if you can drink in the emotion of that. And where are you feeling in your body? Where do you feel that in your body? Oh, I, I kind of feel it from my cheeks all the way to my heart. It's like this sort of, like, uh, definitely like, right, like for sure the heart. Hmm. So this, you know, this is something I would add to high-fiving yourself in the mirror is go back to the best time in your life. When you're high-fiving yourself in the mirror, because then we're getting your insulin involved, we're getting your brain involved in this whole feeling state, because the feeling state is what changes us. We can change our thoughts at a dime, but the feeling state is what changes our nervous system. Mm. So when you do the high-five habit, when you're high-fiving yourself in the mirror, recall the best time in your life and just try and see if you can really get a felt sense of that. Now, what I will do with people who have suffered trauma is I will take them once I have them grounded and once they trust me and stuff, I will take them into their trauma and then I will take them into the best time in their life. So with you, I might do, and we're shortening this considerably for the podcast, but for you, I might say, okay, if if you feel safe enough that we talk about that kid waking up with that kid on top of you mm-hmm. and getting into that feeling, now, where do you feel that in your body? And is, is this okay oh, like now to right go into in this? Gut. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Okay. I, like right okay. in the gut. Like I immediately was like, went from like the heart being full to like, Ugh! like right in the gut and the ankles, weird, the ankles. So what I would do is I would go back and go, okay, now go back to that feeling of dusk. You can see your house, you're playing, playing statue. Mm -hmm. It's fun. You feel calm, peaceful, happy. Now let's go into your gut. Let's go into that sensation again of, you know, waking up with that kid on top of you. If it's okay to stay there for a second and then lovingly go back up into that place in your chest and your throat where you felt really peaceful and happy playing with your brother it's amazing because i feel the gut like pulling me down Mm -hmm. like that it's easy to drop into the gut yep and the bad experience it's hard to pull yourself from that back up into this experience that I can feel that's positive. Is that normal? That's absolutely normal. We're, we're wired that way, Mel. We're wired to pay more attention to fearful situations than pleasurable ones. Because in our evolution, that's basically what kept us alive. So in healing this, 
we have to heal this at a feeling level. You know, we can talk about that kid on top of you for the rest of your life without really changing it too much. You might get a better understanding of it cognitively, but to really change that sensation, we have to use another sensation because that's the language of trauma is sensation. It's the body. Mm. So we use that good feeling that you have. And then we just, we go back and forth. We oscillate between back and forth and, and it starts weakening that power, that negative feeling in your body that you associate with being a victim, with being helpless. Yeah. And here's the other thing about, you know, when I love when you say you're talking about play, because the way this comes in a, in a play is trauma activates both the sympathetic, the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, the rest and digest at the same time. Because we're oh, so confused, we don't know. Yeah, because once you get up to a certain point in sympathetic activity, your body can't handle it anymore. So it shuts down. So we go into parasympathetic. We don't go into pleasant parasympathetic, but we go into shutdown parasympathetic. Hmm. And then it goes back and forth and back and forth. And a lot of us with anxiety, that's what happens during the day. We go into this place where our body just gets exhausted. So we feel okay. We don't feel that tremendous you know, anxiety anymore. And then once we get rested in the parasympathetic, then the sympathetic comes back online and we go right back into anxiety again. So the thing about play and play is so important for healing is it's it's another another thing that activates both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic activity at the same time. So trauma activates co-activation, they call it. So trauma activates parasympathetic and sympathetic simultaneously. So does play. But play allows you to start metabolizing. So when you're in co-activation, when your parasympathetic and your sympathetic is active at the same time, it's like having your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. When you're in play, you start realizing, hey, you know what? This sensation is actually okay. It doesn't have to fire me right into mm. the trauma. So that's why play, one of the reasons why play is so important in healing trauma is because we get that felt sense of, of activation of both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic at the same time in a safe place because play is, is safe and it's wow. fun. Okay, so going back to Carrie and number one, it was very clear to you as an expert and a medical doctor and a neuroscientist that she's dealing with stored trauma. And step one is kind of recognizing that. And then the next thing she needs to do is to recognize that thinking keeps you in the coping mm -hmm. and that this is really going to be about dropping into your body and learning how to reconnect and heal in your body. And one of the things that you have recommended is that we think about this as younger self-work and that you can go back to positive times and feel that good sensation that if you're ready for it, printing out a photo of yourself or putting it on your phone so that you are reconnecting with that version of you where you started to feel separate or unsafe or scared. And that that is a way to start this process. Is there anything else that you would recommend that Carrie think about? Yeah, you have to do it slowly. You know, you have to start because the thing is, when we go into our alarm, we don't want to go in there. Like it feels painful to go in there. So it's do it slowly. You know, and this is, you know, if it's, if you have a real significant trauma, you know, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, you probably need a therapist and maybe a somatic therapist to kind of help you get into this place because it's, it's not, it's not for amateurs in a way. If you have big trauma, if you have trauma that's manageable, absolutely. You can work it on, on your own, but if you have big T trauma, doing this on your own can re-traumatize. So you need someone else there. You need someone there who you wish was there at the time of the trauma, you know, mm -hmm. and that person is you, that person is you. It's like, you can go back. We can use our amygdala. We can use that sense that we are, we are not locked in time. We can go back and find that, like what I have on my phone. I can look in his eyes. I can, I can imagine his eyes too. And there's a great, there's a great song by Peter Gabriel that I listen. This is, we're getting into Dr. Kennedy's world a little bit. Every morning I, I do this meditation that I make for myself. And then on top of that, I end it all by listening to Peter Gabriel's song, In Your Eyes. Hmm. So he has two versions. One's a live, one's a recorded, which is about five minutes. And one's a live version. And he talks about In Your Eyes. And it's about 
in your eyes as a child you know the light the peace the, you know i am mm. complete you know i see i see the the vision of a thousand door i see i see my divinity i see my connection with myself and i look at that little picture of me that's here on, in my on my phone while i listen to that song and the lyrics of that song are so powerful if you if you imagine you know all uh, all my instincts they return like all your instincts return when mm. you connect with that version of yourself that was hurt and in pain that's what happens and that's how you heal from anxiety and alarm we can cope all we want but if you want to heal you have to find that child in you and you have to show them that they're seen heard loved and protected and one of the ways that i do that every day is i start my my day with that song, looking at him. And I, I use different pictures of me, but that's the main one because it's on my phone and it's right there already. I wanted to talk to you because you came into the kitchen tonight and you're like, oh my God, I just had the best therapy session. And I thought, how many 17 year old guys walk into the kitchen and announce to their family that? I don't know. <laughs> I do not know. Do you care? No. <laughs> no, really. <laughs> talk to me about therapy. Do you like therapy? I would like to talk to your audience about therapy. Okay, do it. Guys, <laughs> therapy is like, it's awesome. I love my therapist. I love therapy. When I was younger, I had a horrible experience with therapy. It was with this like old woman <laughs> who like tried to convince me how to use an elevator because that's what I was afraid of. I was afraid <laughs> of elevators. She was like, you need to ride the elevator. And I was like, I don't want to. Um, and so I hated therapy. I hated it. And then, um, I got a new therapist last year and it like changed my life. How? Because I just love having, it's almost like therapy is almost like having a notebook, but you don't have to write and you don't, and you actually get an answer back. Mm. So you don't have to like take the time and your hand hurts and all that stuff to like write down your thoughts. You just say it. And then they say something back to you. And it doesn't have to help, but it's just nice to hear someone say something that isn't part of your friend group or a family member. They're just someone that's there to listen. And maybe that's all they need to do. Um, and I, I love therapy and I would fully recommend therapy to anyone because no, it's not like some bad thing. And if you have a therapist, you're, super messed up in the head and like everything in your life is going to shit. Like, no therapy rocks. You can have it when you're perfectly fine and happy. I, I think everyone should have a therapist because it's just the best. I agree with you. And the thing that I realize now is had I gone and worked with a therapist Oak when things were going, okay, they probably wouldn't have gone back. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Cuz I hate to burst your bubble, but <laughs> you are not going to be able to solve all your problems and your <gasps> friends with the similar age as you and the similar mindset will not be able to solve the same problems that you have. Oh my god. Well, I want I'm so happy and appreciative that you were like, "Yeah, I'll I'll sit down on the mics with your mom and tell you why this therapy session with Keith was so awesome." Mm -hmm. So thank you. Of course. Why did you want to do it? Because I felt like I was in a good mood. And I was like, you know what? Like, I haven't done it in a while. Like, might as well <laughs> okay. just jump in there and be nice. Why do you think I wanted you to sit down with me and let everybody hear you tell me in real time what you talked to your therapist about tonight? Because what you would probably say to me if I said no was it would benefit a lot of people, including you. Yeah, it will. Because I hear every single day from parents around the world about how their kids and their sons in particular don't talk to them. And so it's a real, I think, gift to have you be willing to just sit down and have these conversations. Because it gives parents and people with teenagers and college students and young adults in their lives, they actually forward these episodes, Oak as a way to open up dialogue mm. and it's working. That's why people are asking so often and so frequently that we have you come back and back and back. So thank you. Glad I can help. All right, well, let's see if this helps or not. Let's do it. Okay. You walk downstairs. 
That I did. And we were cooking dinner, and we had uh, your sister on the FaceTime. She was playing a song for us. She just wrote. And you walked into the kitchen. Yes, I did walk into the kitchen. And you said... I love my therapist, Kitty. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny. You just like strolled around. You're like, I love my therapist, Keith. Yeah, I do. Shout out to Keith. What? Respect. <laughs> so what did you talk about in this session? A lot of things. A lot of things. Um, school- Would you be willing to unpack it with me? Yeah, I mean. Can you just tell everybody why you wanted to share this? Like what? Because because I think it's pretty cool that you're willing to. Do you want the honest answer, or do you want the podcast answer? Either. The honest answer is that I came downstairs in a good mood, and I said I love Keith, and you said, "Will you record this with me?" And I was in a good enough mood to say, "Sure." Oh, I like an honest answer. What's the podcast answer? This is game changing stuff right here. Life changing. Is it? <sighs> Depends on how they look at it. Well, is it for you? a viewpoint that i didn't consider about life yeah so it was a life-changing therapy session you just had with your therapist keith low key yeah it's like yeah little little life change right there a little like tweak in the direction that my life is going (laughs) in okay i i I can't wait to hear it (laughs) um so why did you start working with Keith in the first place? And then we'll hear about this life-changing session. How long have you been talking to Keith? Started when? Last year, April? Was it, or was it May? Is it April? Mm-hmm. So yeah, April last year. So almost a year, kind of close to a year, a few months away. Sophomore year. And it was weird because... Um, Freshman year and sophomore year, there was a moment in time in my school life or in my life. In the same point in time, it was, I remember the exact time. It was like March. It was like a March, March time. It was like becoming spring, but still kind of chilly. That's like the, the, the memory that I have from these points in time where it wasn't, it wasn't depression and it wasn't like, I think it was anxiety. Okay. It was overwhelming anxiety in my freshman and sophomore year. And it went away. Like freshman year happened in March. It was about three weeks gone. Forgot about Hold it. Hold on a second. I don't remember you having anxiety. Because I never told you about it. Why? Because I didn't want to make it a huge thing. And I didn't want to go to therapy. And I didn't want to like get into that. I didn't want to get into that. Wait. I was like, I can do this. I can I can solve this. I can get over this. Like, we're good. And we were good freshman year. Wait, hold on a second though. Stop the stop the train. Stop the phone. Stop the train. I want to get off. Don't you dare do that to me. We'll, John Mayer. We'll include that later. Um We'll include that later. I had no idea that you were struggling with anxiety for three weeks in freshman year of high school you hit why did you hide this from me i've struggled with anxiety my whole life the 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 when i talk about that specific time period it's when my anxiety was at this like weird peak where i just like couldn't really do anything and i was terrified of what no idea like i couldn't tell you freshman year and i'll i'll get into what it was later because i know now but there was this is probably going to terrify you. Oh, I don't God. know if you've heard this story. I don't know. Um, I wrote a memoir about it in sophomore year. So there was this one day in freshman year that I remember. That's like basically the only thing that I remember from when I was anxious like that. And it was, I was, this was actually the first day that I came. Um, I wrote this memoir called The Blue Ceiling because artsy. And like there was this like <laughs> moment where like, Later in the day, I'll get into it. But anyways, I I woke up and it was like one of those it was one of those March days where it was like there was no snow, but it was like kind of like foggy yeah. and misty. Yeah. And where we live, like when you look out the windows, like you can't see anything. So it like you feel like you're in like a snow globe. And so I woke up and it was like one of those days where I was in a snow globe and I was like, you know, what? like I'm just going to like stay in bed and watch some TV. Like that sounds nice. OK. And so I was doing that. And all of a sudden, like boom like semi truck hits me like i'm lightheaded i'm confused i'm like 
what's going on. Like nothing feels normal. Like I don't feel safe right now. Like I'm really scared. I don't know what to do. Like I need to get out of my room. Like I need to go. I need to go. I need to go. And so I like open the door. I go downstairs and I see dad sitting in front of the fire and he's like, Hey dude, what's up? And I was like, I didn't, I didn't tell him that I was freaking out, but I like looked at him and I was like, I'm okay. Like it's whatever. And then I like walked outside I like looked around. I like took a deep breath. I was like, whatever this is, like you've been anxious before, like you can get over this. Like it's fine. Then I go back inside. Yeah. I wanted to hug dad. I wanted to like, I don't know. I wanted to do something. I wanted to reach out. I wanted to get help. I wanted something and I couldn't do it. Like I just couldn't. I didn't want to. Why? Because I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to become a process. I didn't want to have to do stuff because I felt like I knew what I was doing. And then what happened is I went back up to my room. I kept watching TV and I remember going back downstairs to find dad and he wasn't there. And then I look towards the kitchen and I like, oh my God, like Rick, like thinking about this moment is so like, weird and scary and like I would never do this ever and it's super out of character but I looked in the kitchen and like I (laughs) you're gonna be very nervous when you hear this and I looked also maybe trigger warning for the viewers I mean listeners sorry guys maybe trigger warning for the listeners but I looked at the kitchen and I looked at like the um the knife holder Uh uh-huh and like I Like, like almost like a movie. Like I could fully imagine myself like stabbing myself in the stomach with a knife. And like part of me was like, I should. And I was like, holy fucking shit. Like this is not happening right now. Like I am not suicidal. Like I don't want to kill myself. Like I want to live. So like I go back outside. I like, I'm like hyperventilating. I'm like, (laughs) I'm like hyperventilating right now. And I like look around. I'm like, I'm like breathing in and out. I'm like, like, I'm going to be okay. Like it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. And like there was this feeling of lightheadedness and I just couldn't think clearly and I felt like nothing I I would do in that moment would ever matter and so why do anything and so that's why I had that thought is like I should just like stab myself because like if I don't if I do something and it doesn't matter like why do it like why do anything so like why why would I keep living my life if nothing I do will ever matter like why not just end it now then that night The reason the memoir was called The Blue Ceiling is because later that night I had this like ceiling projector. It was like it projected like this blue night sky onto my ceiling. It was super cool. Still have it. And I just like remember this is going to be like such a main character moment, but (laughs) it was like (laughs) and it is. I, I will fully admit to that. But I like I reached my hand up and I like looked at my outline of my hand and I was just like crying for no reason in like the dark, the darkness of my room is like my ceiling was blue. And like, that was the only light. And I was just like Mm -hmm. looking at my hand outline and crying and just being terrified. And then it basically just like went away. It was gone. I never thought about it again. Freshman year, like it was gone. Didn't think about it. Can I ask a question? Go for it. Are you nervous about what I might ask? No, not really. Well, first I just want to say thank you. For telling I me. feel like I told you that before, right? Not that part, no. I could give you the memoir and you could read it on your own time if you wanted to. Um, I would love to. I would be happy to give it to you. I think it's really odd that you never told me that. I forgot Because we have a, like a really good, oh my God, open relationship. We have a relationship. great relationship, as stated in the family podcast episode, Will which you was stop? Okay. wonderful. I'm plugging, Mom. Uh, I know. <laughs> um <laughs> Um, no, but I, 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 so number one, I'm surprised that you never shared that with I me. I know why I didn't share it with you. Why? I didn't share it with you because two reasons. Okay. The first one was I didn't want to get into it. I didn't want to get a therapist. I didn't want to go on meds. I had horrible experiences with meds and therapists in my past. <laughs> and I didn't want to go back into it because I was just like, no, no thanks. And two was because since I've had, I've had anxiety my whole life. Like I have I wouldn't say every day, but like every week I've probably had like a small anxious panic, if you will. Like, a, oh, my goodness, I'm like anxious right now. Uh, like I'm anxious. I'm nervous, whatever, whatever. And like I can handle it. I can okay. do it. Yep. And so I felt like I could handle it. And like the reason I didn't tell you is because I was like I did. I thought I handled it. Like I was like, it's over. Mm. Like it didn't come back. Mm. That's interesting. It did not come back. Yeah. Okay. I want to say one other thing. Um, 
I want to address the fact that you may be listening to us talking about a very serious topic and we're giggling and we're light about it. People laugh when they're uncomfortable. Oh, true. except I wouldn't say I'm uncomfortable. I would I don't know if I'm uncomfortable right now, but I'm just like I don't know. I feel like this is easier to talk about when I can like throw in a joke. Got it. Have some fun. That makes sense. It. You know, Oak, I want to specifically address what you said about that thought that you had about the knife. Because those kinds of thoughts that are really big, scary, overwhelming thoughts, they can seem uncontrollable because they can come out of nowhere and they can start to get more and more frequent and overwhelming. They are very normal. In fact, according to therapists, almost everyone has experienced a situation like the one you described. But I want to talk further about this topic because it's helpful to talk about it. So hold on to that thought because I know there's more that we're going to talk about because I got to pause real quick for a word from our sponsors and we're going to be right back. Uh, by the way, you're actually watching an episode of the Mel Robbins podcast behind the scenes. Yeah. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube and yep. also follow the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You want to know why? Because the more this show grows, the more we can continue to bring this to you at zero cost. And that's a really big deal for us. So thank you for supporting us by subscribing to YouTube and by also following Mel Robbins podcast on a podcast platform. Yeah. All right. Back to the show. Cool. Welcome back. I'm Mel Robbins. And I'm so excited you're here because I'm talking to my our 17-year-old son, Oakley, and he's just in real time unpacking a killer therapy session that he had tonight with Keith. 30 minutes ago, I got off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're supposed to wait a day, but no, we just we just jumped right in. We just jumped right in. We are a deep end kind of family. Let's go, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's the other thing I wanted to say. We have two years from this, meaning we've had two years distance from this topic. From the freshman topic. Yes, yeah, you're yeah, in yeah. a amazing place mentally spiritually fantastically yeah and so there is no danger no and so i'm not triggered by that and the other thing i wanted to say is would it surprise you to hear that having thoughts or a fleeting thought about ending your life or dying some death like that is normal yeah because i feel like like suicidal thoughts are I feel like it's been talked about to the point where it's like you're at the worst of the worst if there's suicidal thoughts like this is oh. where like shit is going down like it's bad like this is bad like this is the worst of the worst like this is horrible like um I get it like you're at the end of the line when so the like, truth is so when you hear like so when you hear that somebody has suicide like when you just said would you think it's normal that most people do? Like, I'd say no, because it's like... No, I, most people do. I wouldn't expect everybody to be at the worst of the worst, even oh, though... Oh, I see what you're saying. What you're saying is this. Because this has been talked about so much, particularly to your age group... Yeah. It makes you think that when you have a thought like that... It's more just that, like, I feel like it's talked about where it's like... It's only, like, the people with the worst condition are going to have that. Got it. So it's not so like when you say like, oh, everybody has it. Like, I'm like, really? Like, I feel like it's only the worst of the worst that because happens. of it, no, it's normal to have those kinds of thoughts. So I just wanted to address the what might sound like a weird tone or an insensitive tone to say we're two years away from it. Oakley's in an insanely amazing place. Oakley is in an incredible place in his life, in his mental health his spiritual health his, he's just happy and period <laughs> period it's somewhat normal to have those kind of thoughts and it's very clear that that in and one of the things that i think is very important i've said it over and over and over again is this there's a big difference between wanting to aim the pain or the anguish that you're feeling right now and actually wanting to end your life. Mm. Mm. You can figure out how to lessen the pain 
or the sadness or the weirdness or the anxiety that you're feeling. And you can do that and you don't have to end your life. In fact, you make your life better by talking about these things that are overwhelming you mm. and asking for help. Because you can't just keep them inside. No. Because no. what happens when you keep them inside? It like, it's like, it's kind of like a Coke can. Like when you shake it up, and then it explodes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's why I'm proud of you for talking about this, Oak. Because it can be torture if you've got that trapped in your own head. Oh my God, it's horrible. And I think most people, including the people that we've lost, that we love, to death by suicide... I still would say most people, if somebody had assured them, if I can take away all the pain that you're feeling and you could still have your life, would you want to be here? Hell yeah. Right? Hell yeah. Exactly. Now, I want to talk to you listening and just check in with you. And what I specifically want to make sure that you hear me say is that it is normal to have these big, scary, and overwhelming thoughts. And when they come out of nowhere or they seem to get louder and louder, it can be terrifying. I know it was terrifying when this all started happening with Oakley. And I'm telling you that this is normal because so many people suffer because they believe that the thoughts will never go away. That's what I believed. I thought it would never end, and I didn't want to live the rest of my life with those thoughts. Now, if you knew the thoughts were going to end, would it have made you feel better? Yeah. If you knew having those thoughts pop in your mind was perfectly normal, would that make you have felt better in that moment? Kind of, yeah. I I'm glad that you said that, Oak, because I think so many people, when they start to suffer because of these really scary thoughts, um, they don't tell anybody. I didn't want to tell anyone. I know, and I wish you would have told me. I wish you hadn't suffered alone. I wish you would have told somebody because the second that you start to talk about it, it immediately relieves you of the burden of carrying this on your own. Right. You can figure out how to lessen the pain or the sadness or these awful like kind of thoughts that keep popping into your head. You can do that. And you can do that and you don't have to end your life. In fact, when you do that, you make your life better. Mm hmm. How? Yeah. And that's why I'm saying this to you as you're listening to me in Oakley. Tell someone if you're having big and scary and overwhelming thoughts. Tell anyone. Just tell anyone. I also want to tell you, if you're having big and scary and overwhelming thoughts, you're not fucked up. No. Those thoughts are temporary. They will pass. And they're going to pass so much quicker when you get them out of your head and you tell someone. You know, my friend Amy, uh, who you know, Oak, she said when you have big, scary thoughts like that, she heard a therapist say it's like being trapped in a paper bag. You can't see anything. You can't think of anything else to do. It sort of clouds your mind. But the second you find the courage to say it out loud to somebody, it's like that paper bag. It just shreds. Mm -hmm. And you'll realize and you'll see that you're not alone anymore. There are people there that can help you and will help you. And what you're experiencing is normal. And you can get through this. And so I had a question because, you know, you just said to everybody, Oak, that you didn't tell me about what was happening freshman year. No. And what would you advise somebody who is listening to this right now, who relates to what you're talking about, and maybe they haven't told anyone? The reason why I'm asking this is I know so many parents and aunts and uncles and teachers and therapists are going to forward this episode to young adults and college students in their life and uh, just people they're worried about. So knowing that you just explained that you were worried I would make something of it, you didn't want to get into it, you thought you could handle it, knowing what you know now, what would you say to that person who hasn't told somebody? Well... If you are um, close in age to me, I don't know, teenager, mid-20s, mid, I don't know, college, high school, middle school, whatever, it does not matter what is going on in your head. If it is overwhelming, if it is scary, if it is stopping you from doing things that you can normally do, 
you should always, 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 always tell someone. And you may be worried that it'll make things weird or it'll change things in your life. And it most likely will, but it is going to change your life for the better. In the beginning, for me at least, I thought to myself that, hey, I can keep this in. Like, I've done it before. I've done it 10,000 times before. Like, I can do it again. And yeah, you can do it in the beginning. But instead of waiting till you collapse, just get it over with right in the beginning and tell someone. That's all you have to do. It'll make it better. It will make it better. Do you wish you had told me earlier when it was happening in ninth grade? Yeah. I do too. Because I doubt it would have come back in sophomore year. Ooh, good point. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.